Hey guys, it's Morgan coming back to you with another weekly schlog here from Highland Cycles where we show you all kinds of cool dirt bike stuff, tech tips. We laugh at Zach and Leandra. We even have Kenny here working on his own bike. And uh, we do all kinds of cool stuff. So if that sounds interesting, stick with us. It's going to be a ton of fun. All right, guys, so first up on my lift, and technically they are on my lift, is that set of forks off of the uh, 2019? Anyway, they're air forks off of KTM, so they're all pretty much the same. Internals have changed over the years, but the way we do fork seals is all the same. Um, I've filmed those forks quite a few times, so I'm not gonna go in depth here today, but I will bring you guys in tight on the schlag. But guys, Real quick, I don't mention the sponsors of this channel enough, and I'm sorry sponsors, I do mention them sometimes, but not nearly enough. Uh, one of the guys I want to mention today for this week is Leading Edge Supplements. Um, they are a really, really cool group of guys. They're old uh, Air Force pilots, I think? Anyway, military pilots who were looking for a, something that helped with like brain fade and alertness, and so they came up with their own um, drink mix basically and their own electrolyte mix for hydration so um, they're awesome I've talked about them before there we go uh, this is their severe clear enhance repair prevent so this is their um, more alert like brain fade awesomeness and it's awesome so it's really good it's all natural no sugar no sugar in their um, uh, the flight sticks which are the hydration electrolyte ones so I like that, no sugar, because all these drink things, ugh, too much sugar. But I have to say a huge thank you to them. They have been a huge supporter. Also, guys, if you want to order any, go to leadingedgesups.com and use code Highland. Um, and you'll save money. It'll be awesome. It helps us out. It helps them out. It helps them know that I'm doing my job. I really appreciate them. Also, I just have to have give a massive shout out for our longest running sponsor, and that is uh, New Tech with Nitro Moose. Jeff Douglas, thank you. You have been helping us out here for so long. It's been so wonderful. I've had so many years of absolute trouble-free zero flats, and it's been awesome. So if you guys are looking at Mooses, definitely consider those guys. All right, let's get to work on these forks. All right, guys, so I got the air side done. No big deal. Uh, and I'm working on the um, damping side. And I figured, I don't think I've ever really explained um, how this all works. And since we're a TPT shop and we're doing all this custom suspension, I figured I'd give you guys a deeper look into exactly how all the suspension stuff works. So, let me show you something. Here is, this is the compression valving. And this goes in to the top here. I'm not gonna screw it all the way in, but we'll put it in. So, well, actually, so this goes in here and drops into this. And this is a twin chamber, or, you know, um, closed chamber fork they call it, uh, twin chamber. So anyway, this, as you can see, this goes in here. So imagine, I'm gonna set this down. Imagine this is in oil, spring is on it holding this down, and then below it you have this, which is the mid valve and rebound valve. So it sits like this. Now I'm gonna show you kind of how it works and I'll go in deeper. But when you hit a bump, this comes up, right? So it's pushing up and it's pushing oil up and it's pushing it through these holes here, through this piston and into this shim stack. And I don't know, there's a shim stack that rides right on top of here. And that's what we revalve. We change the order and thickness and diameter of all these shims because they flex like this out of the way as the oil gets forced through. Um, and so, and then also, this has, the spring also has something to do with it too, because if it pushes hard enough against this, it'll raise up and let more oil through. But I don't want to talk about that right now, because that's a specific thing to these. But really, the important part is that the oil, again, as this pushes up and forces oil up, it comes, like I said, through these holes, through this thing, up through this piston, and into that valving. And that is what you're controlling. You're trying to make that 
in our world, off-road world, you want to have the initial part of the stroke be really flexible and let it move quickly so that you hit the little chop, it, the wheel comes up out of the way right away. But if you hit something hard, it the oil butts up against hard against these shims and resists. And so it slows that down and catches it. Okay, so that's that. Now, and that's why you, you control it up here. You've got a clicker up here that's turning a valve, or excuse me, it's turning and it's pushing a needle. It says you click this down in, it's pushing a needle in that's blocking off this hole here, which is a bypass. So the, the narrower you make this opening on the inside, the less oil that can bypass so that it slows it down more, makes it stiffer or moves slower. So then, take a look at here. This is your mid-valve and rebound valving. So as this pushes, the oil, it's pushing oil, and it pushes through these big holes and in here, and it hits this, this shim, which moves real easily. Uh, it's actually on a spring, and it can move down out of the way anyway whatever moves easily and lets through but so it's a mid valve because and, and it's it's not just rebound valving it's a mid valve because as it's coming up it's also letting oil through here and metered by this shim and then also um, just these holes in the piston slow it down a little bit but it still comes through so if you had this solid and it just pushed forward only and like didn't let anything through it would probably hydrolock. It would be so stiff it couldn't work. So, anyway, so that goes through the oil. Now, it's got a, you know, you got your, the springs over on the, on the air springs on the other side, you know, but forcing it back open. Now, what's happening is this comes down oil. It's coming through these holes and up through here and hitting these shims. And this is the rebound valving. And this is what we would change if we were going to, you know, change the rebound on this. We would make it you know, either thicker, thinner, stiffer, whatever, because as, as this is pulling through, that's resisting the oil coming through and slowing it down. Then the adjuster is this, it comes in here, and you guys aren't gonna be able to see this, but in this hole, if you look in there really tightly, when I push on this, you'll see the needle coming up and slowing that down. So if you wanna slow down how quickly it goes, you, you push this in, you know, click it in, and what that does is it closes off an orifice in here that is also the bypass that lets it come out here. So the oil will go through here and out, and less of it can do that the further in you push this. So if you guys have any other questions about this stuff, please let me know. Um, it's pretty complicated slash simple. Does that make sense? I don't know. Um, there's a lot going on. But it's a pretty simple system. There's nothing moving other than the flexi shims and stuff like that. So anyway, pretty cool. Gonna finish uh, bleeding this thing, put it all back together, and this gotta be ready to go. All right, guys, got those forks all done. Now we got another set of forks, another set of KTM forks. These are from an 03, uh, 125 SX, I think. Anyway, 03, 125. These are open chamber uh, KTM forks, which I'm not 100% sure I have filmed. So we're gonna go in depth, film this in depth, and uh, Show you guys what's on here on the schlag, guys, though. Um, show you some highlights, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I actually really, really like these forks. Um, the open chamber WP forks are really good. Um, they're, you know, better with some valving and stuff done to them, but stock, they're actually a pretty darn good fork. So anyway, let's get started. Reinstall adjuster rod. Guys, like, when I do this on all the bikes, I like to take that and push on it, make sure it moves smoothly, and it's got a spring back to it. If it doesn't, you need to take things apart, get in there and clean it, but that one's moving great. All right, guys, so uh, I was taking apart the other fork. I normally don't film it um, because it's just the same, but um, remember on the other fork I showed you that you have to push on um, the uh, rod to make sure that the spring works and the needle moves. Well, this one didn't. I pushed on it, nothing happened. You can see, super gross. There we go. So, um, that's just from neglect, time, whatever stuff. But, this can be fixed. So what we're gonna do is check it in the ultrasonic, get it uh, nice and hot, and then we'll clean it off and get this moving. And I'll show you where this goes. It's on the end of the uh, rod in the cartridge. It goes up and down. Um, the valving sits on here, moves through the oil and this needle goes in here to either close or open this bypass. So anyway, that's why you gotta check this stuff, guys, and that's why 
we as Highland Cycles slash TBT do a really good job on your forks and make sure everything is working. Currently, this thing is completely closed off, so his uh, rebound damping was shut, done on this side. Like there was, it was all the way closed. So it would have been really, really stiff and really slow. So get this cleaned up, come back and show you what it looks like when we put it back together. All right, guys, got it out of the ultrasonic. Uh, it looks, well, first of all, it came apart. That's nice. <laughs> it looks a lot better. Um, hit it with a little bit of brake clean, too. I still got a little bit more cleaning to do. But, so here is how this works. So if you guys want to know how forks works, pretty cool. Um, again, this is the rebound. It's got a little O-ring here. It goes in here, and the O-ring is a little bit messed up. I'm going to put a new one on it. But here, let's take that off so you can slide it easier. That goes in here. And what it does is it'll, it it creates, it either slows down or speeds up, focus, there you go, the bypass of oil past the valving. And the bypass happens through this hole and out this hole. And so that needle goes down and it shuts that orifice off. And this was stuck all the way close. So basically no bypass on the rebound, meaning that the rebound still worked, the piston was still moving through the oil, but it wasn't. Um, you couldn't open it up and let it go a little faster, so it would have been a really slow rebound. Anyway, that's going to be way better. We're going to put a new uh, O-ring on that thing. We'll get this thing back together. I'll show you how it goes back together on the rod. All right, guys, we've got to walk over here to Zach's World because he has all the cool suspension stuff over here. Here is our damper rod. This goes down in like this. We'll put a little red Loctite on that. I don't know that it has to have it, but why not? All right, there we go, guys. Now, when this goes into the fork, this has got this going to have. We got to put the piston and the valving back on here, but it moves through that cartridge, uh, and then, like I said, that's the bypass. So this is where that damper adjuster rod goes. So I'm gonna show you when we put this thing in, how it's supposed to be and it's supposed to spring like I showed you on the other one. All right, so here's the valving, guys. Put that back on. Definitely putting some Loctite on this guy. Since we got rid of the peening. There we go. All right, guys, we got those uh, forks all done. Um, got that uh, spring or the adjuster all freed up. It's working great. Really happy about that. Uh, it's definitely going to make that bike work way better for Joe uh, this weekend when we go racing. And speaking of racing, <coughs> I am, um, you know, I loved racing the 125 last year and I had a great time in Natarita with it. But I really, um, this next race is in Monticello, Utah, and there's well, it's a, on a motocross track part of it, and there's some big hills and things like that, and so I want some horsepower. So I'm bringing the 300, and uh, <laughs> I want to show you what I did because obviously we know how dangerous it is to carry a chainsaw on there, especially without a scabbard. But um, obviously I could take that off, could take the mount off, but I know that I'm going to do a bunch more cutting this year because there's still a ton of trees down on all our trails. So I didn't want to take it off because it's kind of a pain with the build dart mount really doesn't come off and on that easily. So, check it out. <laughs> took the chainsaw, took the scabbard off, uh, and then I have zip tied my number plate to the thing. And I think that's gonna work, as long as I don't crash really hard. I think it's gonna be awesome. So it's gonna be fun <laughs> to run with that. I'm gonna leave the headlight burning and uh, the tail light burning with my brake lights so people can see that I'm on the brakes. Uh, it should be awesome. Pretty stoked uh, about it, guys. I love the race in Monticello. It's a lot of fun. The course is really good. And I'm excited to race a uh, bike with a little more horsepower this year. There was one jump I just could not get over. 
on the track on the 125 because I was fat and they had it all tilled up. I just couldn't get the, the drive out of the corner. So decided to get this thing out, get after it. It's going to be good. All right, guys. Next on the lift is this lovely Sherco SE300. Um, it is owned by an awesome guy who's got a KTM. Uh, and he's thinking about selling that KTM and keeping this and it's interesting because he's not had a lot of good luck with this thing so uh, right now it's here because it seems to fire up and run just fine uh, for a while and then it gets warm about 30 minutes in and it starts to die and it'll like all the way die and not restart real well and anyway so I've got a guess is what I think it is you guys should comment below what you think it is um, obviously we're gonna get to it here right now I'm gonna dive in um but yeah i think i i think i have a good idea of what's going on uh, we're just gonna have to find out all right guys so uh being that this is one of the first shirkers i think i've had on the channel uh let's dig into it i mean we've had ryan's down here just did suspension anyway uh this is the first one we've had a problem with <clears throat> there's not a ton of shirkos around so anyway Let's dive in and take a look at what is different about these things than other bikes. First of all, one of the biggest differences is it's got this electronic power valve on my new bike. Uh, my 23 300 is going to have that too. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that is. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people with Shurko's. They seem like they really like it. It works pretty good. Um, but um, yeah, it is one thing that could fail and I'm going to pop that cover off. We'll just take a look and see what it looks like under there uh, just so we can see. Um, but uh, one thing I'm finding already that I don't love is the placement of the shift shaft in relation to the frame and all that stuff because, first of all, it was kind of a pain to get the bolt out from underneath here, which, okay, no big deal. I got it out. But now it won't come off because the bottom chain slide is so... To me, guys, that should be like super simple <laughs> process and i don't know what that even looks like i don't know where the bolt is that holds it i mean i'm sure i'll find it here but that seems like less than optimal for a design shift shifters break and stuff all the time so you think you'd want that to be pretty easy yeah, anyway, so we'll keep going here. Um, the reason I'm taking that off is because I want to take a look at the stator. That's the first thing I want to take a look at real fast. Uh, I'm going to measure the ohms and stuff like that too, but I just want to look physically at it because a lot of times you can tell something right away. Uh, another big thing about Shurko's is it is carbureted, which is awesome. This has Electron on it, um, but there is no Kickstarter or a way to put a Kickstarter. Uh, and actually, I just had a friend sell his Sherco because it died in a race, it wouldn't restart, and he had to run and bump. Anyway, it was a nightmare. All right, guys, quick, uh, take a look at the power valve actuator. Um, looks like I can pull it right out. I'm not going to do that because I don't need to, and I don't want <laughs> have to figure something out uh, right now. Um, I might do it later, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, so, yeah, that's what a power valve actuator looks like when we get the KTM one in here. We'll take a look and see if it's anything close. Um, anyway, we'll cover that back up. But what I'm trying to do, like I said, I still can't figure out how to get that off, but I think I can loosen this and get this cover off without um, removing that now. I think it's far enough out away. the uh, Then we'll take a look at that stator and see if there's anything obvious going on. All right, guys. I uh, got the stator cover off. Looks absolutely perfect. Um, but this is just charging, so... It doesn't mean that it's that the ignition system is okay. This is just the charging system. Uh, that is the ignition, like the pulser coil. So, and you can't see that. I was just hoping to maybe, if this was getting cooked, then it would lend itself to maybe the whole system's getting cooked. But um, so that we can't see. So we're going to measure the ohms on that. We're going to take the tank off and get it there. But uh, here we go. If you guys want to see what the starting system looks like on a Sherco, it's kind of like the new KTM's. The, looks like the starter is over on the bottom underneath, just like the new newer KTM. Uh, then it's got a Bendix here, uh, and then well, when you hit the button, the Bendix comes out this way, hits the flywheel, spins it. So pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna put that back together. We'll take the tank off, and then we'll dig in to find those wires. Can't see exactly where 
the plug is for them, so I'm sure it's just underneath the tank. All right, guys, so I have gone uh, pretty deep into this thing. I've got to the Pulsar coil wires and tested them. They seem like pretty decent specs, like 92 ohms, which is about normal. Uh, and then I just went out and rode it. I rode it for 15 minutes, got it hot enough to where the fan was coming on, rode real slow, so it got hot. Um, also pulled the air filter out to get the battery, which is not my favorite place for a battery. I mean, I guess it's down low and all that, but like it's underneath, you gotta take the air filter out. That seems like a bad idea, because then if you wanna charge it, you absolutely have to, I guess, well, I don't know. I guess, actually, I take that, I was gonna say, you take the air filter out, to, anyway, you do have to do that if you want to jump it, but um, well, maybe not even then, because because the uh, solenoids here, you can, I guess you could hook to that and then to ground and you'd be all right. So okay, I take that back about having to pull it out, but it still seems like a silly place for a battery. Um, yeah, anyway, whatever. Um, but battery is charging, it's charging even when it's hot, so I don't think it's electrical. I think we've, I can rule out the fact that it's an electrical thing. I thought that was originally the deal. So. Now I'm leaning towards what I know has happened in the past for other um, bikes with electrons, is I'm wondering if maybe the electron float is sticking and it's running out of gas, you know, like, and then it jiggles loose and gas fills it, runs and does it anyway. Um, because I, like I said, I got this thing, it's hot, like really hot, even the stator cover's hot, all that stuff. So I don't think it's electrical breakdown um, on ignition. So we will go a little bit more into it. I'm going to take the tank back off and uh, take a look at the spark plug. I didn't look at that first. No big deal. Um, and I got to say, like, another thing I don't love about the Sherco is the tank. Uh, it doesn't fit that great. Like, this is kind of a weird thing here, whatever. Anyway, um, and then I don't love where the petcock is. It's, like, way up back in there and kind of weird. And when you're trying to put the tank on, the petcock was to hang up on wires. Anyway. Sure go. So far, not like impressing me. It's a cool bike. I love the way they ride. I've ridden a buddy of mine that rides really good. I love the way the chassis feels. It feels very comfortable, uh, especially a guy like me who loves YZs. This thing feels good. I like the suspension. There's some weirdness going on. Like I don't love the fit and finish and things like that. But, but anyway, whatever. Doesn't mean it's a bad bike. I'm just saying this is my opinion. So uh, anyway, take this off. Take a look at the spark plug. See how that looks. All right, guys, so digging deeper into the Sherco, I uh, pulled the spark plug out, uh, and it looks fine. I mean, it's maybe a little on the rich side, but not, you know, whatever. That's fine. That's no big deal. Uh, it's definitely not super, super black like the ignition was breaking down, uh, which is what I was worried about <laughs> with uh, everything testing out and being good. seems like that's probably not the case. A lot of times, though, um, Guys, if the ignition is breaking down, the spark plug will be super fouled and really nasty looking because it just it wasn't sparking hot enough. Anyway, whatever. So I am currently leaning towards this Lectron uh, float sticking every now and then. And I don't really know what to do about that <laughs> other than, I mean, I could take it off. I think I have a float needle for one uh, and put that in. I don't know. I'm probably going to pull it off and at least inspect it, take a look in there. Uh, see what's going on then ugh, i don't know other than that uh, other than like actually taking it out and riding it i don't know because it's not failing around here it seems to be good so uh yeah let's go ahead and pull that carburetor off we'll take a good look at that uh, and we'll put everything back together oh actually i forgot sorry i want to show you one thing about this sparkle we're going to put a new one in it so let's see that focus Focus, jeez, there we go. All right, so you see that washer right there. That is a crush washer, and it's supposed to be flat. So let me show you what a new one looks like. Focus. So there is the new one versus... Well, that was not tightened down all the way. So that could also be causing a problem. Usually it wouldn't be a huge issue like where well it wouldn't be an intermittent one it would just get loose and lose compression and not run or not run very well uh, this one seems to run just fine and then drop off so might have just been on the like almost tight enough <laughs> but uh that is something guys you really need to make sure you tighten your spark plugs you don't want to strip them out obviously because when you do 
it's a huge mess uh, fixing a head and all that. That sucks, but you definitely don't want that loose because you lose compression. Bike won't run as good, all that stuff. So, all right, let's get that Electron off and take a look. All right, guys, got the carburetor off, but I uh, just got to say uh, this is a win. Uh, win one for the Shirko. I've been kind of complaining about some things I don't love about the way this is designed, but huge win is that the carburetor was really easy to get off without having to undo the subframe or anything. Uh, I don't know if I needed to, ha I probably had to have the tank off, yeah, for sure. Um, but that's okay. I don't know if you can, tw I don't think you can twist it because the petcock, I'm not sure. Anyway, whatever. But getting it off was super easy. Like I said, did not have to undo subframe, twist up, take pipe, all the stuff like you do on a KTM or some of the others. Carb came out really easily. Now, let's get this thing apart and take a look at the float setup. Thing I don't love about electrons is they use standard Allens, which doesn't make any sense in today's world. <laughs> Especially with pretty much every, especially dirt bike being metric. I mean, even Harleys are now mostly metric. Alright, there's the needle. Needle looks alright. Float looks good. Uh, seat seems good. It looks almost brand new, really. Uh, so I'm gonna blow through the thing and make sure there's nothing just like clogging it up that maybe was intermittently clogging it. Seems good. I don't know, let's see. All right, so with the Electron, like, there, see? I don't know if you guys can see that. You probably can't, definitely not, but right now, the float is stuck. There it goes, it just opened. So, there it's stuck again. So, I don't know what to do about that other than and you just cleaned it, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna put it back together. I think it'll lube it up to have, you know, oil and fuel on it, but like it's stuck, there we go. It doesn't stay stuck, I don't know. That's a weird one, guys, and not awesome. So, um, yeah, anyway, we're gonna put it back together, see what happens, but everything looks perfect. I don't think putting a new one is gonna fix anything. All right, guys, so that is going to be the end of the schlag. Um, but I have a few things. Please don't go away yet because I have a couple things I want to show you and talk to you guys about. So first of all, we got the Shurko all dialed in. Um, new moose up front, M59 up front. Uh, same old moose in the back with the V-Moto uh, Apex rear tire. Or excuse me, V-Moto Force AT rear tire, not Apex compound because I still can't get those right now. Um, but we did uh, <coughs> put an Enduro Engineering skid plate. But Fastway foot pegs, those are some of my favorite aftermarket foot pegs ever. They really are good. Uh, also fixed his throttle. It was sticky because it had a little too much cable slack. And the little, there's like a guide down in here that anyway was not quite right. So we got that fixed. Uh, Zach also did a serious job trimming that front wheel. It was way out of whack. I mean, way out of whack. And Zach did a brilliant job of getting that dialed in. So. Nice job, Angry Zach. Um, let's see, uh, as far as the running issue, I could not make it do anything else weird. I really think it was that carburetor uh, float sticking sometimes. So, cleaned it. I think it's going to be good. Uh, anyway, we will report back if anything else weird happens with that, but I think we're all good to go. So, guys, here's the deal. Here's something very exciting. I'm super, super excited to announce that we're going to be starting uh, very soon a new. Uh, build series. I've never done like a moto build like thing. Like I've shown you cool stuff I've done to my race bikes and other dirt bikes, things like that, but never like a build build um, where we do a bunch of custom stuff. And this is going to be the basis for that build. I'm really, really excited. It is a 2002, I think, YZ125. 
This is how it started its life. Um, my good friend Roger Hurd gave us this uh, basket case, <laughs> and it definitely is a basket case. But thank you, Roger. I really appreciate you drove it out here from Prescott, Arizona. And um, yeah, I'm super fired up because I have been wanting to tackle putting a twin cylinder two stroke into a modern frame, like a kind of a dirt bike frame, and making a street tracker out of it. If you guys haven't seen a street tracker, I'll try to remember to put a picture of one right up here. Uh, it's basically a flat track bike, but for the street. Like it's not a actual race bike. Um, I'm not gonna build a real race bike, um, mainly because real race bikes don't have lights and things like that, and they're all twitchy and high speed and things like that. I wanna make something that I can ride around town uh, and maybe take up to a hill climb event, which would be cool, like a road race, hill climb thing. Anyway, so the next thing, I've got the chassis. Um, Obviously, it's got everything we need. I mean, I think I need wheel spaces, some other things like that, no big deal. But, so I've got the chassis. What I need now is a twin cylinder two-stroke motor. And I'm reaching out to you guys, um, both if you have one or know of someone that's willing to sell one, that'd be great. Also, if you're at all interested in sponsoring this build, either as a business to get your name out there or as a person who just loves what we do, um, yeah, definitely looking for help on getting that motor. Uh, I don't know where one is, <laughs> you know, whatever. I'm gonna start looking, but I would love for you guys to help me with that. That would be a really, really big deal. So anyway, I'm gonna shoot an intro and all that good stuff on this thing later, but this here on the schlog, you guys are the first ones to hear about it. I'm really excited about getting this thing done. It's gonna be a ton of fun. So. Anyway, guys, that's the end of it. I love you so much. Thank you so much for spending time with us here at the shop. I know time is valuable. You guys spend it with us. It means a lot to me. Um, if you are new here and you had fun during this or anything like that, or you thought it was valuable, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, maybe tell your friends about it, that'd be cool. If you've been with us this whole time and you're like, Morgan, I've been here since day one, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Anyway, I hope you guys get out and spread the gospel two wheels, and I desperately hope that what we're doing here at Highland Cycles is inspiring you guys to work on and get out and ride your dirt bikes!